where supports come from. Sorry, that's okay. I uh, want to uh, acknowledge where supports come from for some of the work you're going to see today, which has been the Oregon Ocean Science Trust, the Oregon Sea Grant, and National Science Foundation, and Hatfield Green Science Center as well, just in terms of infrastructure and support. So uh, it's always hard to figure out, you know, how and the scope of what to cover in something like this, because I'm sure some of you know a whole lot about oysters and Olympia oysters, and others may know very little about them. So, um, so it's kind of a, that's okay. Got it, got it, <laughs> we got it. Um, so, well, it's kind of a little bit of a covering some different areas of things about Olympia oysters from experiments we've done in the lab with Olympia oyster larvae and some really interesting results from that to work we're doing right now in the field. We were just out, Marlena and Elena, two students in my lab, we were just, Spend the day on the point of here, measuring some oysters up in King Slough and changing sensors out and doing all kinds of good work. So, um, and I also just there's a dozens of people that have contributed to this work over the years. Um, I came out to Oregon in 2009 and I was sort of working on oysters a little bit prior to that on the East Coast uh, in Chesapeake Bay and was excited to come out here because there's a whole lot less we know about the Olympia oyster in general and a lot of opportunities to learn about the estuary out here. So these are just a couple of pictures of Olympia oysters out in the field. And I actually have some show and tell shells. You guys can figure out when we can pass those around or come up and see them later. And I even brought some, I don't know exactly how old they are, but I got some shells from the Gulf Coast of uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, Louisiana. And we think they're about 5 million year old oyster shells. So okay, check those out. They're really different and kind of odd and really thick. So, okay, so uh, just a little bit of kind of the roadmap, try to cover a little bit of background on Olympia oysters first. Um, and then what does our changing world mean to uh, oysters and Olympia oyster and oyster habitat? And then uh, uh, talk a little bit about some experimental work we did with Olympia oyster larvae. There's some good news in that. I know often, you know, you come to these things expecting to hear the worst, and actually, the oysters are kind of, like, kind of resilient. Um, and then some of the work we're doing right now, the oyster grew up in the field, trying to understand what's controlling that. And uh, and then some other interesting related work underway, a lot about shells. So these are just some pictures I pulled off, or my students pulled off. I think this is actually, I understand, is roughly near the area where the uh, Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery is in the Torrance Bay, if you guys are familiar with that. So, um, and so oysters have been a really critical part of, the, of, our, of humanity, really, and of the settlement out here and a really part of the, part of the economy. So I want to start with, and I, I like to do audience participation talks, so I hope you're all ready to sort of get engaged, not just kind of nod off. You know, my students are a little tired, so I'll let them get on the path. What is an oyster? What's an oyster? Just shout out. They're, okay, five out. Good. We've got the class, right? That's the kind. That's the class of taxonomically. Filter feeder. They're filter feeder. That's good. What else? When you think of oysters. What else? They're delicious. They are delicious. Yeah. Not everybody likes them, but I, I bet my people sure do. Delicious. What else? Anything else come to mind when you think about oysters? Good bird food. The good bird food. Yeah, if they can get through the shell, right? That's kind of tough. No, they're from aspects. Huh? They are. Yeah, one of the really interesting aspects about oyster biology is that they change sex over their lifetime. And so they often start out as, let's kind of make sure I get this right, start out as males. And then usually after a year, they reabsorb all their gonads and re-express them as females. And then later, throughout many successive years, usually they'll be females. And so the timing of that, and, and it's not a hundred percent that they all switch or go through that process, but it's often that they do change sex throughout their lifetime. Any other cool oyster facts anybody else want to contribute about? I've got some here. Filter feeding, so these are what came to mind when I was thinking about this. Bivalves. They make shells, right? Shells are kind of cool. One of the really interesting things that I think and I get to work on is how things make shells, what prevents them from making shells, how long do shells last in the environment, 
They create habitat, right? A really important habitat in many places for other organisms. They clean water, filter feeding, taste good. Uh, there actually there's some there's some evidence that they might be related and important for the evolution of the human brain. So the nutritional profile of oysters are full of omega-3 fatty acids. And there's debate, so this is not way outside of my field, but some of the anthropologists debate this about whether or not the consumption of shellfish in particular is what allowed the human brain to evolve the way it does, because we eat a lot of that omega-3 fatty acids to get that brain. Some of the earliest human jewelry ever found are shells. And they're aquaculture globally and for a long time, right? So it's modified, wild harvested, but also modified that. And now lots of places and people and for a long, long time while they're in various ways. They can filter 50 gallons per day for oyster. Think about that. The Libby oyster is a little smaller, that's kind of an Eastern oyster perspective. Um, bivalves, right, are two shells that are identical. Uh, we don't fully understand how they make shells. We know components and aspects. We know what the shells are made of. But what happens at the really micro scale of taking these car calcium and carbonate ions out of water and making precipitating them, we don't really fully understand how they do that entirely. Um, they build reefs. So Olympias tend to be more low relief, so they don't build reefs, but lots of Rosastria oysters. Yes. Will build these really high relief systems and in Chesapeake Bay, they were navigation hazards. When the settlers first sailed into Chesapeake Bay, they were shipwrecking all the time because their bay was just filled with oysters, right? Uh, clean the waters, right? 50 gallons a day, that's a lot. And what do you, what else does that do? So when you're taking all that stuff out of water, why is that so good? It reduces turbidity. Yeah, it reduces turbidity. Yeah, what's that good for then? Everything. Eelgrass. Eelgrass, right. So there's lots of these associations, ecosystem services, and functions that they provide. So they make the habitat and make larger areas available for eelgrass, like the that tree further. Um, okay. Ooh, in aquaculture, there's been some research on this, and I, I would say it's not 100% vetted entirely, but it has. Some people have argued that oyster aquaculture is one of the lowest carbon footprints of any food production system in the world. Mo better than most plants and plant-based agriculture in fact. And I don't know where the numbers came from and I can't, but the, what I've heard and uh, have been told and read is that the only thing that beats it is potatoes. <laughs> I don't know why, not a, not a uh, agricultural scientist, but apparently potatoes have a lower carbon footprint than oysters, but then after that it's oysters, and then all the other vegetables after that. So, <laughs> do they take into account nutritional values? I don't know. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, it would bump them up. So, okay, so there's an oyster, right? We're sort of talking about it. Oysters have a complex, we call a complex life history. So what that means is that they have these larval stage, and then they have an adult sessile stage, right? Where they don't move, they kind of cement down to something. So this is more for a Austria oyster. We'll talk about some of the differences in a minute, which are kind of interesting with Austria as a genus of Olympia oyster. Broadcast spawners in the Austria genus, they release sperm and eggs to the environment and nature takes its course and hopefully there's some collisions. And then you have some larval oysters within a couple, within two days or so. Now you've got a shell would call Bellinger, a couple of weeks later, head of Bellinger, foot swimmer, if you know your Latin, that foot swimmer starts looking for other shells or habitat and the land down and it finds where it wants to stay, it goes through what we call metamorphosis, and then it actually sort of becomes an, a baby juvenile oyster. It will change its body plan, and sort of cement itself down, start creating the habitat. So the timing varies. For different species, so how long that lasts. Um, not all oysters are broadcast spawners. One of the really interesting aspects of Olympia oysters is that they brood the larvae. The females don't release the eggs to, to uh, water for fertilization. They actually filter sperm out of the water and will have internal fertilization and then brood those larvae for sometimes a two weeks or so and then release them after that after they develop much further. So in a 
sensitivities and a global change perspective. The one approach I take in my research is to look for these bottlenecks, these things that might limit the population growth. For Pacific oysters, you guys may have heard of the oyster crisis and the aquaculture issues. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, there's this really important bottleneck right here in the hatcheries where at the point from fertilization to 48 hours later, this basically exposure to acidified water here for Pacific oysters would actually have these impacts that manifest two to three weeks later. They would lose massive amounts of production. Um, and so let's see, the hatcheries, right? This was a very specific loss that was there, but there's many possible weak points in this life cycle. This whole life cycle for the population to grow, reproduce, and create new oysters needs to be able to get through this whole process, right? And so one of the things that I have spent a lot of time thinking about is the habitat and the shells. How long do the shells last? So one of the big questions we don't know, how long will shells last in the future? And, and, and will oysters, and Olympia oysters specifically, be able to build shells faster than they can create or break down? Because if they can, that's what we call a negative shell budget. And if we want to keep them growing, if we learn that they can't keep up, then we will have to do something to augment and make sure that the habitat remains. Otherwise, the habitat is continually lost. Okay, so um, oysters in general, they're basically filled almost all the temperate estuaries throughout the globe. Anywhere it's kind of temperate, oysters were primary organism in most of those places. Um, and they created many of those Drosophyria um, type oysters, created these large regional systems that just fill the entire estuary up and change the whole dynamic of it. So Paul and I were just talking about the shifting baseline syndrome, right? And, and I remember even coming out here myself and saying it's beautiful estuaries, you know, compared to what you often see on the East Coast, but they're lacking oysters, right? And they're, those, they're gone. And in fact, many people believe that the Olympic oyster may have been extinct 20 years ago. It was the numbers were so low. Um, and it's been argued that oysters globally are functionally extinct in many places, meaning that the, the numbers are so small that the, what they used to do to the environment, that ecosystem service or function is lost. Okay. Here's kind of my ecosystem services slide about oysters. There's been uh, evidence of enhanced fish production. So back in Chesapeake Bay, upwards of five pounds of enhanced fish production just where you have oysters a meter squared of oysters. So if you've got a oyster reef that's about that big, you're gonna have five more pounds of fish production there because of how they're focusing nutrients and creating habitat and, and sort of focusing all this food there. This is a uh, water a few hours after you put oysters in there and not so right, we talked about filtration, seagrasses, uh, there's all kinds of really interesting nitrogen dynamics. Oysters can stimulate loss of nitrogen from the environment, not just from assimilation, but from stimulating sedimentary processes, but that in the brain evolving. And I always sort of pitch this, that we hear a lot about coral reefs, and corals are certainly threatened. But in terms of reef systems, why aren't we thinking more about oyster reefs? May not be as pretty as corals, but probably much more important for many of us places we live. Okay. And they actually can make shell mature in far greater rates than most globe. In habitats that actually the chemistry and the thermodynamics don't really support that. So they're really good at making shells once they get established. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm sorry, are you saying that our native oysters made uh, reefs like these? No, not quite like these. They, 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 what we understand that they were more kind of low relief system. Their clumps were kind of, they would cover parts of the subtitle and maybe into the inner title a little bit, but the, the sea floor and the estuary floor would be covered with oysters. They would be sort of locked together in kind of this thin layer. And you'll see, well, I can see right now. So here's some, Lena, you'll have to tell me how old are these oysters, these Olympia oysters? He's about a year old Olympia oysters. For Pacific oysters, here they get that big. 
similar eastern oysters to that. So they don't make a whole lot of shell very quickly. And I think that's probably part of the reason why they didn't build these big, massive reef structures. Our tidal range is also really large. So if you build a big reef structure, you're going to spend a lot of time out of the water. It's probably not good for them as well. But again, we don't really, I mean, this is all started with learning some of this stuff about them. And then this other one is interesting too. So after um, Sandy in New York City, there's a whole lot of interest and there's a lot of work going on there about using these living shorelines to help against flooding, right? And oysters were a big part of that or are, are a big part of that concept of the living shoreline to help buffer flood events. So lots of good ecosystem services, right? I already mentioned this, two oysters, two common oysters on our coast is the Olympia oyster, Austria Lorda, scientific name, and the Pacific oyster, which is the aquaculture species that's, that's grown here. That was introduced in the roughly the 1930s after the native oysters were fished out with the gold rush in the late 1800s. They managed to fish out that, the native oysters in a few years. In fact, follows many other fisheries curves that you see, that exploitation curve where large, large amounts of uh, resource extraction. And because they grow so slowly, small, right? This is hardly in any idea of this one, probably about a year or two. These yeah. are all from your experiments yeah. from out here in the field. So this is a you know, year, two years, not gonna be a whole lot bigger. So you need a lot of these, right? These are some of those Gulf Coast oysters, right? So they're quite a bit more than these ones. So, so they were exploited and they don't, their generation time is a bit longer too. So it follows kind of the fish rate like that. So, and this is just showing the oyster shells, Pacific oyster shell, size. Okay, so here's one of these uh, fishery curves. There's a great uh, issue in the Journal of Shellfish Research in 2009 dedicated entirely but the oysters, so there's data reflected from NOAA um, going back to the late 1800s as best we understand it to look. Here's this extraction data, thousands of pounds per year, and you can just see right that exponential decay. No, I don't know what happened there, but somebody found some oysters, I guess. Oysters. The habitat of the oysters, the central oil from British Columbia, all the way down to the southern tip of Baja, California occupied the entire west coast of the U.S. at one point. And this is survey data, so this is a little bit aided at this point. Uh, surveys that were done across the west coast from Cabo San Lucas all the way up into British Columbia. And these are showing ranks or categories of moisture density. And so the darker the number means a higher number. I'm trying to remember the scale. It's maybe close to a thousand, the highest scale per meter square of oyster. So you can see they're around, but if they is right here, I think that's probably underestimating how many are there grass. These are today. It's a really nice restoration work there as well. Um, so, but back in 2009, as far as we knew, there weren't very many of them around in many pastures. And there's still much smaller numbers than we understood them. So uh, there are also not a lot of genetic mixing. So David Stick, who was a student at Chris Langdon's over half field in science center years ago, did a really nice work on the genetics of one of the oysters throughout many of Oregon's estuaries. And they're genetically different. And if you think about it, think about the estuaries we have here, they're kind of small, lots of exchange. Think about how hard it would be if you're a little oyster larvae, you've got a week or two floating around the ocean to actually just manage to get sucked back into another estuary, right? So they're quite genetically distinct. So it's not a lot of mixing things there. Um, we see a fair bit of juvenile oyster production and we're getting a whole lot. So at Oregon Oyster Farms, they get a lot that settle on their shells there. So there's clearly, they're out there, probably need some more habitat. Uh, there's been that shellfish preserve, some of you may be familiar about Neatarts Bay. That was a big nature conservancy, ODFW and other partners. Um, established habitat, there's a lot of oysters out there. And there's just a ton of people working on this stuff, including people in this room. And so that's, this is good news, right? There's people working on this and I think we're making progress. 
I wanted to bring this up just so you can see um, some of these projects are highlighted. This is the Native Oyster Olympian Collaborative. It's out of East Davis. Got a nice interface here. You can go on, shows you the information about those projects, how many were planted, the monitoring that had been done, how the numbers may have changed over time. Uh, and so it's been big projects in Utah, Chipuna and Uze, which were the ones that we think historically had some of the largest numbers. And then this was a some work of Brad Steve, who I was on a committee for, worked with Steve Rummerlo at the W, uh, worked with some other folks. They're creating oyster, they call these oyster tiles, recognizing that we're lacking habitat. These are 3D printed calcium carbonate tiles that are out on the side flats out here. They're monitoring now, seeing if they're getting settlement on there as a way to help facilitate providing the habitat without having all the shells available that they need. Okay, so where do oysters live? Talked a lot about oysters, but where do they live? Estuaries. Estuaries, right. This, this looks familiar. Yes. Right? Good. Good. Yeah, in the right place. Where do you think they live in the estuary? Where would where would you think their habitat would be? How far out? Do you think you have oysters here? No. When you think somebody shout when you think we've reached the beginning of oyster habitat. Oregon Oyster Farm. Beginning of Oregon. So you're all the way over here. That's going to take another 10 minutes for you to get this. Sorry. Somewhere around here. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. Probably in these mud flats yeah. here. King sure. Slough. King Slough for sure. Yep, up here. Uh, what about on this end? Right here's Toledo. You think we get oysters up there? Right. Get crap out there. It's too fresh, right? So we actually put some shells out. I'll show you some pictures of this again in the talk. Um, here at Powell Park several years ago, we measured their dissolution rates. And the undergrad at the time I was working on that, when we put the shells in, she said, why do we put different shells at Paddle Park than the other sites? We started with the same shells, but they had dissolved little minuscule things with themselves. And we wrote some Pacific oysters down here. They don't make it through the winter. It's pretty fresh. So, so probably somewhere here, out to somewhere in there, right? But uh, that's the extent of the estuary or river miles that they probably have access to. Sure. Yeah. The food news was at the hospital right there. Yeah. Do you think historically they were all the way through that whole thing? There? It, it, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I haven't really spent any time up in here. I don't know how a lot of this looks like it's marsh. Like, well, that's fine. I did it for decades. Yeah, right. So I'm talking historically. Yeah, it's possible that they could have been up there. I think, I mean, they're definitely down here. You know, the question is, this is probably too fresh. This may not be exactly maybe okay. Depends on rainfall, and some years maybe it would be better, and other years it's not. Okay, so uh, salt, temperature, maybe carbon dioxide, which is syndication and substrate, right? Okay, I'll try to not move around. That's okay. Do your thing. Yeah. Okay. So, how do you think these things are going to change in the estuary? Do you think the habitat's going to expand, or do you think it's going to shrink? Sea level rise, salt in the estuary. Yeah, that's a good, right? Sea level rise is going to barely move more salt out the estuary, so it might expand that way. Things might warm up, right? We don't really actually know very well what the temperature and thermal tolerances of the oysters are, believe it or not. That's kind of one of these fundamental questions in global change biology that we just don't really know very well. Uh, carbon dioxide is going to go up. There are actually places in estuaries where the increased temperature might actually be really good for them too. They might make them grow faster, develop, get into developmental stages more quickly. So it's not maybe all going to be bad, right? The really hard part of this, all these things are changing and changing in different ways. They change seasonally. And there's a tremendous amount of daily variability that these things are exposed to. So, so we're all trying to get at this at scientific side. It's a really tough question. So 
I want to bring you to some good news about Olympia oysters. So this is work we did several years ago on trying to understand the ocean acidification impacts on oysters in general. Um, and really know what ocean acidification is. If you heard of it before, more CO2 gets dissolved in the ocean, changes the chemistry, pH drops, saturation of pH drops, and so on. It sounds really bad, right? Really, it was really bad for growing aquacultured oysters in this region. Got a lot of national and international attention. I was told that this work up here in the Pacific Northwest is what helped save funding at NOAA in many ways because it was a real tangible thing that the NOAA program officer could go to the Senate and Congress and say, we have a problem, businesses are being affected, it's related to climate change and we need to understand it. So this is a great example of something, but we also want to know what happens to the native oysters and the things that were sort of live here, right? So this is uh, data we collected from experiments on Pacific oysters. There's two graphs here. This is a proportion of larvae that develop normally after 48 hours at different saturation states. The easiest way for me to explain this saturation state number is think about it as the number of building blocks in the water. And so the higher this number, the more building blocks for shells, the more calcium and carbonate that's present. And if it's below one, it means we're lacking in those building blocks and it's not favorable to make shells. Now, organisms can do it, but it gets harder and harder. And so you can see two different experiments right around this point, Pacific oysters start having a real hard time making shells normally and out of their form. We also measured shell length of the normal ones because you can see even in these undersaturated conditions that are corrosive and not very good, some of them actually developed okay. But when they did develop, they were smaller. Putting more energy into making the shell, they have less energy to grow, more energy in maintenance. Um, so then we wanted to look at this with Olympia oysters. And there's the Pacific oyster data. And there's the Olympia oyster larval data. And we said, how did this happen? Everybody and everything that we read up to this point, all the literature, suggested that all oysters should be extremely sensitive to ocean acidification. And here's the data. And they actually look like they do worse, right? As conditions are more favorable to make shells, they look like they do worse. There's no effect on shell size at all. We had to repeat the experiment because we were, I was convinced somebody recorded stuff the wrong way, right? There's just no way this could have happened. We did it again, we found the same question again. So it was really interesting, Pacific oysters, 24 to 48 hours, right? This is what they look like when they don't develop normally, but they've got a full shell. Olympia oysters take 150 hours to go through that same process. The other thing you should see, here's a, that same stage of the Pacific oyster, you see they're about 70 microns or so, they're about the diameter of your hair. <laughs> the Olympia oysters are double that size. They're bigger as larvae. And the other really cool part of this is I mentioned that they grew the larvae. But one of the things we had to do was figure out, we had to get them out of that brood chamber and see if they developed normally. We didn't know we, they would. And so another student at Chris Langdon, Matt Gray, who's now in University of Maryland, figured out you can actually take them out of the, the fertilized eggs, out of the female brood chamber, and they develop just fine. There's no physiological benefit at all, which was sort of mind blowing, right? It's probably an ecological thing or something else while they evolve that. Okay, so mentioned those time frames, right? This is kind of the time frame for uh, Pacific oyster larvae. These are scanning electron micrographs again about the diameter of your hair, how big one of these things are. Um, this is the beginning of the shell, the bivalve, that's the crease the two valves forming around the larvae. The way I like to sort of think this happens is they sort of form that initial material and then start building the shell and sort of almost like fill out. And then 16 hours to 24 hours later, they've got a full shell. And the rates that we measured for this happening, some of the highest calcification rates that have been measured of any animal. Just in this short period of time, they go from zero calcium carbonate right here so 90% of their body weight, calcium carbonate, in the course of less than a day. 
right? Six hours at the end of the day in some cases. Olympia oysters take their time. They grow more slowly. So they get, I love this, my favorite ones we've got, it's like Pac Man, right? That video game. And it takes about almost a full two days or more, right? It's quite a bit longer to go through that first development. Um, and there's major differences in the reproductive biology. Pacific oysters will produce 20 million eggs per female. Tons and tons of eggs. Olympia oysters like 100,000 eggs. And they make them much bigger, right? So they're putting more maternal investment in the eggs. And they're, they're hedging against needing lots of variability for uh, natural selection. So then I came up with this. We have to figure this out a bit more, right? I came up with this horrible experiment. The grad students hated it in the lab. But said we've got to measure the calcification rates of these things while they're growing this period of time. So every three to five hours, we spawned oysters for several days. Every three to five hours, somebody had to take a sample so we could measure how much calcium were in those larval shells. So this is about calcium in the shell. This is a Pacific oyster. And this works out to, I know the number probably doesn't mean anything, but five nanomol calcium per millimeter of shell per hour. And for the Olympia oysters, it's a fraction of that, right? So weird things that happen here, that's stuff that's cool to talk about, but we don't have time tonight. The other thing we did was actually look at the amount of lipids for energy that those oyster larvae have, right? They're an egg, they get fertilized. They need that energy from the egg to do that initial development. So this is a ratio of the energy lipids, the structural lipids, like cell, phospholipid bilayer, basically lipids, so the energy lipids. This is a decrease of almost 40% per hour in that ratio during the shell building period, making all the calcium carbonate, the Olympia oysters, the school, slow, no worries, get there, right? There's almost no change in that energy thing. So I call this a slow shell, right? I thought this was really cool. It turns out that as people have looked at this in other taxa now, things that beat shells slowly are less sensitive to acidification. And interestingly, uh, so the term, if you got familiar with Stephen Jay Gould, the evolutionary biologist, he uh, came up with this years and years ago. Exaptation, it's a trait that it evolved for some other purpose that when the conditions change, turns out to be very valuable, right? We often think of evolution of needing this genetic mixing and turnover and all this testing, but sometimes things are there that turn out to be really useful. And I suspect this slow shell building wasn't evolved to deal with ocean acidification, probably more some other ecological aspect that turns out might be really useful for providing resilience to acidification. So that's really good. We don't have a larval bottleneck like we do in Pacific oyster type restoration. So. Okay, so what about juveniles? Some work at least Senator Matt Davis did years ago. The key thing here is that they're not entirely insensitive, right? So juveniles, you see, you see some of the effects. And the kind of interesting aspect of this work was 52 days post settlement. And just during exposure of the larval period, the uh, juveniles were smaller. Even after 45 days of common condition, they just never really fully recovered. So they're not fully immune, but they don't have that acute problem and mortality that the Pacific Oysters do, right? Do we know what preys on these little guys and whether the predation is greater if they're slower growing if they stay small? Yeah. Um, I mean, my guess would be crabs are going to be a big one, right? Oyster drills, mollusks. I mean, probably very similar things to other oysters. And yes, I, I don't think we know very well the predation rate on this. It's a big area. A need to understand the environment. Yeah. Okay. So, what about oysters in the field? That's what we're kind of working on now. So, here's what we've been doing in Yukuna Bay. Some of this for going on five years now. These are all the sites we have sensors out at, measuring things like temperature and salinity. We're growing Olympia oysters for going on here now at Hatfield, Cape Slough, uh, the oyster farm, 
pulls the Sawyer's landing, and we've got sensors all the way up to the kind of quarry. And at these sites, we've got 100 Olympia oysters. Every couple of weeks, as we're getting into summer now, we go out there, they get all laid out on a black backdrop. We take a picture to get sizes, they get weighed in order. Marlena does an amazing job tracking all of this. So we have these growth rates. Uh, a lot of this work has been done with Jim Lerzak, who's a physical oceanographer. So he's got a grad student is developing a thermal model for the bay to understand how changes in temperature and climate might change temperature throughout the bay. And Jim has done a lot of nice work on actually modeling the physics, how the water goes through the bay with tides and discharge. Um, and we're going to, I think Marlene is a little glutton for punishment or just loves Olympia oysters that much that we're going to put another 100 oysters out next week, I think, at those same five sites again and track them through another cohort. We've also got working with some folks at EPA. We've got the heat sensors here. Uh, pool slew and now uh, half field. And those are collecting pH data every 15 minutes. Those are going to run hopefully until October. <laughs> we'll actually have some really cool time series data and seeing variance with tides and all kinds of other variation here. We see a tremendous amount. I'll show you some of the temperatures. So this is what the field looks like. I figured a little break here for a second. So our research vessel I rescued was in a, a yard at campus in Corvallis. It was sort of neglected and forgotten about. Trailer axle had rusted solid. We had to get a mechanic to come out, weld, cut it off, and then try to do before you get any work done. But now we've got this out. This is a oyster farm. Our proud OSU sticker on there. Um, and we've even built a flow through seawater system on this boat. It's 16 feet long. We've got a little ag diaphragm pump where we can pump a gallon and a half of water per minute. We've run that through a CO2 sensor. We've got temperature and salinity. So we've been doing maps now, how that changes in the surface water. So now we collect all this data. This is what it looks like. Yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is, it's complicated, right? Now, how do we make this into something to understand how oysters grow in relation to this. So these are just five sites that we have oysters at. This goes back a little before we deployed oysters. We deployed them, that was about here, right? Um, on the top here, we have temperature Celsius. And generally the warmer colors are gonna be closer to the ocean. And as you go up river, we get to the polar colors, green and blue. So what do you see? Temperature, right? It's all pretty similar in the winter time. Summer time it spreads out, lots of variation here, and then it converges again in the winter, and then it spreads out again in the summer. And perhaps even more interesting is the salinity. Right. So we see these tidal variations and seasonal event variations, rainfall amounts. This was uh right, so we were trying to get oysters out in May last year. And this is what was going on in December, right? It was raining and cold for lots of months. And uh, they just didn't even reproduce until much later that year. So, uh, and then in summertime, so it's interesting that the temperature varies in the summer a lot through the estuary, but the salinity doesn't. In the wintertime, salinity gets very variable and the temperature progresses. And in fact, slide. I see this better. So this is that same data. The same data. This is just from our deployment period. You know, the oyster Marlena did a daily average. They take out tidal variation just at one point per day, and you can see much of the same kind of seasonal variation, this convergence, and even things like salinity. You get uh, just salinity a lot more. Yeah. Well, there's a dash line up here. Temperature gets colder even up river in the wintertime than it does down closer to the ocean, right? And that makes sense. The ocean modulating temperature better. Um, and then you can see these kind of seasonal salinity events are switching out of our upwelling to downwelling and so on. Okay, so here's some of the surface CO2 mapping we've done. This was actually a Boyne Laco, the similar setup, uh, important class that I grad field course I do. So uh, on the left, it's a low tide in the morning, 
And on the right is a high tide in the African native. And the scale is the same. So the yellow values are 1,300 parts per million. And the blue values, uh, it's really hard to see, that's really basically atmospheric CO2 levels, right? So low tide, all the runoff, all that respiration, all the plants breathing out at night, you get almost four times higher CO2. And that at least has just the tide and all the plants now breathing in, right? And so what does that mean for an oyster living in the environment, right? So this, these are the big questions we're trying to get at. There's a lot of uh, work. And so the building these initial models of the bay with the mixing and temperature, the first steps to them being able to build a CO2 model that we could actually look at what this looks like and having this data to validate that model is kind of really cool. Okay, so one thing we're trying to do with uh, comparing the growth rates is we're going out measuring every couple of weeks, especially in the summer, what the conditions are. So we have a bracketed window of time. We know how much they grew in that window of time. We know what the conditions are. So we can take for each of these periods of a week or a month, we can take the mean conditions, we can take maximums, we can integrate things, see what actually is going to be important, both how the variables are changing in the environment, but also what variables are having the biggest effects of growth. Okay, this is what it looks like. I told Marlena, you need to copyright this, put it on a tie or something, right? <laughs> this looks like a wallpaper somewhere, right? It's like lots of texture. But they yeah. you lay out the oysters. These are uh, with the oyster. One of the things that's really problematic and challenging is we take these pictures and we weigh them. What's growing all over these oysters? Yeah, we're all over everything. So the data of our system. So we have to track. So we weigh them. So what we do is we end up weighing them with the particles, and then we'll have to scrape them all off, and then weigh them again. Yeah, hundred at each site. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, but we're getting some great data. I mean, this is super cool. I'm going to show you some of the growth rates here. So um, this is the average change in wet weight from July to September of last year of total live weight. They're weighing them while they're alive, and we're just taking those weights. So you can see some places where it's landing, they grow a lot faster. Somewhere like Pool Slough, they didn't grow as much. In other places, it's pretty similar, even though when you think a half the an oyster farm, you would think those conditions are pretty different, right? But the growth rates are the same. So the challenge we have is then discerning maybe some things are keeping the growth rate low here. The other things are keeping it over here. And Sawyer's Landing, you guys know that. It's, you can see it, right? But there's some differences in the conditions, the chemistry, the temperature, and so on. So this is the weight, the area, centimeters squared. And now, the ones that are growing that way the fastest are not actually the heaviest, right? Those are up at King's Loop. Shells are extending faster. That's one of the neat things to do about shell growth in oysters. There's shell extension and shell thickening. Those create very different parameters in terms of weights and sizes. The other neat thing we see is very low mortality. That's really encouraging. We have in little aquaculture cages. We do get little baby green crabs in there and stuff, but they're all doing well. I think we have maybe less than 10 when we first put them out half die in that first interval. But now we're only getting one or two every month in each of those cages that are dying. So mortality rates are really low. That's really great. Here are some other. These are uh, Olympia oyster shell and tissue weights. So these are now we bring them back to the lab every three, somewhat frequently. Now we're starting to take 10 of them out of the cage, dry them out, we measure where these are wet weights. So we're just the tissue and the shell. So we can separate those. This is the shell weight, you know, how the, the King Slough ones are being processed currently. So um, you can see a fair bit of variance, differences. But again, remember those weights, pool slough were low, but the shell weights are actually a bit higher than this may. And the tissue weights, we sort of separate all that stuff to go a bit higher. So and then when we had calculated this, we talked about this the idea of shell density, it's kind of a proxy. So if you just take the weight of the shell in the area, it'll tell you something about thickness or density of the shell. So despite 
the tissue weight being higher, cell weight being higher, probably not as dense in other things. And more fresh water maybe up there. So again, still trying to understand some of these patterns. Okay, about done. Uh, so come back to this question about habitat, right? What happens to the shells after they die? And an oyster reef, the way we understand it, that is bigger reef type system, is that the oysters grow, at some point they die, and those shells become part of that reef matrix, along with all the biodeposits that are deposited in there, which makes it geochemically a super interesting. If, if you're really into chemistry, you can really kind of, I think one of the most fascinating environments to think about the environment, like all this calcium carbonate and all this organic carbon together. Lots of CO2 and lots of shell material. And we've done some work with Chesley Bay on this. And the alkalinity generated in the oyster reefs that we studied there were amongst the highest rates of alkalinity fluxes anything that's been measured anywhere, even compared to coral reefs. So coming back to you point it here, this is this illusion rate. So these are experiments where we basically put shells out at few different sites. Here's that saturation state number. This is actually up at uh, Paddle Park. This is an oyster farm. That's at Hatfield Marine Science Center. Mm -hmm. So you see, right, as we get closer and more undersaturated, the rates of how quickly that shell dissolves increase quite exponentially, really, right? So, if ocean acidification is pushing it this way, right, that means that the habitat is going to be around as long. And what we need to know is how quickly these things can actually generate the shell and contribute to that. And this is also surprising. These are not statistically different. Those rates are statistically different, and those rates are different. If you let the oyster shells actually dissolve more quickly, which I thought was going to be the other way around. We don't know why yet. This was that image of those shells. Same shell, they start out about the same size, stomach oyster shells, to the year after at the half field. So they look like a year later at Powell Park. It's going up the estuary that far. It's almost entirely driven by all that fresh water. It makes the saturation state much lower, and then you have some of that metabolic carbon in there. It also helps lower that saturation state. Okay. I am going to leave it there and not read all of this. We're just about at an hour. And I want to give you guys a little bit of time for questions. If there are other things you guys want to ask. So thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I wasn't I'm talking to you guys more. So that is okay. They were talking to you. They got some questions for you. Great. Um, one was, is when is Yaquina Bay east of OSU, probably a half field, going to be reintroduced with Olympia oysters? And uh, there's a comment that the eelgrass there is starting to recover. Oh, uh, so, and the tie flats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, um, we're I, part of what we're trying to do is right now figure out where the best place is to actually do this restoration work. And there are other groups working on some of that restoration. But I think this is a great opportunity to be sort of trying to get resources together and think about where do we want to put things. And I think we have some ideas about where historically they were. And there's been work in Pool Slough and as well as uh, let's see if I can pull that map up really quick. Okay. So I think talking about in this region here. So there's been a, a select and then a bunch of work right here. I think there's some other spots here as well. Um, and, and I think they've largely been successful. I think one of the challenges I've, I've heard is that they tend to be sinking into the sediment. And so one of the, I think, big challenges we have is figuring out how to do this in a way that is going to let them grow and sort of establish that habitat and not sink and get buried or dissolve more quickly. So, but I don't know all the restoration plans are there. There has those oyster tiles I showed you throughout this region in South Bend earlier. Yeah. Yeah, oysters are such good uh, filters. 
it seemed like they, they would also absorb a lot of pollutants and other bad things. So how, how, how true is that? They, they can, for sure. Yeah, and if they're in polluted waters and there's lots of bad stuff there, then they do. And for example, in, so stepping out of Quinta in New Jersey, right? Not a lot of clean water, especially around the New York metropolitan area. There are aquaculture farms there, and what they often do is depurate, called depurate the plants before they go out to market. So they move them into filtered clean water. And usually within a, several days to a week, they can rid a lot of that stuff. It depends on the pollutants and other things, right? But but they can actually get rid of a lot of that stuff too. So so one, right, one impact would be they're catching some of this stuff and then they're actually consolidating it now in a sense. And I don't I don't have a good sense of all the potential pollutants in the point up, but it's far better here than lots of other places. So they're they're good to eat. There's nothing you should be concerned about as far as I know. The main thing is Lou puts this up at his farm. Summertime, it gets warm back here and it's getting worse. Right? You see it actually, the temperatures have been going up and then there's Vibrio outbreaks. So you have to cook the oysters. As long as they're cooked, you're okay, but if you can't keep them wrong. And that might be a, something that becomes a bigger problem from the culinary retail side down the road. We got another question online. Uh, is uh, well, one comment actually first. The Yukona Nature Preserve, which is just south of King Slough, there yeah. uh, has maps of the late 1800 oyster holdings in Yukona Bay, and also has photos of oystermen harvesting skips. So just a kind of interesting comment that's probably available yeah. on their website. Cool. Um, and the question from Cindy is. Um, is there a comprehensive water quality testing being done to know what human contaminants are in the estuaries? I don't know. I, maybe somebody in this room knows better. I, I mean, there isn't, I mean, you have Toledo, right? That would be one source, but again, you, you don't have a really high population density and the work that a lot of you are doing is securing land and helping to prevent more development. How we manage that, but I think that's there's also the work the Yukon Bay Management Estuary Management Plan that's underway. So Paul, you've been really involved with that. You may know. And there is 303 D listed stream designation on upstream in Toledo and in the estuary, so it does exceed the standard. So it's a detail that for anybody can pull up for which and for uh, once for human consumption and recreation. Yeah. And the other is temperature and sediment. Yeah. As you go further up, sediment's coming off of bad lands and right. lands. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would think at the Hatfield Center, there's long term data sets on the water they're taking in for use in experiments and everything. There's some. Yeah. There's some. Yeah. There's some. Right. Um, yeah. I'm sure that there's scattered data sets. They're not doing, as far as I know, comprehensive. And the problem is what's what you know, there's a whole suite of that or pollutants, right? But I know there's definitely oxygen measurements that they have. There's I know also there's been um, there's almost 10 years of PhD that the EPA has collected in this area as well on the dock. Um, I think the, the big problem we were just talking about this earlier with the students over dinner. It's like all these things that we use as chemicals that we don't even know right now that might be really bad. Right. A lot of these things, and that it's, it, 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 you know, all the cosmetics, all the drugs, right? All those different things that what ends up happening is we don't even know that they're bad until 10, 20 years later because the permitting process for producing that stuff and then ending up in the waste stream, there is none. Right. As long as it doesn't make rats sick or something, right? Then it becomes something you can put on your skin and it goes down the drain, right? And it's really interesting because even things like caffeine. That's one of the best measures of human waste because it passes through your body unaltered. So lots of places where there's a lot of sewage discharge and you have a lot more human discharge, they use caffeine to track that. So yeah, I, I, again, it's a great question. I just I don't know. I'm sure, and I, I don't want to shortchange because I'm sure some people have collected some data, but I don't think it's a comprehensive continuous data set that they collected because it costs a lot of money and that's what are you screening for? No, there. So, yeah. 
I was curious if the articles on the oysters are a positive, negative, or neutral influence on the oysters growth rate. If you're removing them, yeah, we didn't. That's a great question. So we didn't we didn't leave some on. And you might want to repeat that question. Okay, so the question was whether barnacles are actually good or bad, right, for the shell sort of growth or preservation or any of those things. So I, I have a little pending right now to actually look at this because we are working on an aspect of looking at we have we are working on a thing called mud blister worms. Which are very prevalent in east in the Pacific oysters in places like Neatards Bay, and they burrow into the shells. And what they actually end up doing, what we're seeing, is that the shells therein are lighter and they dissolve faster than the mud blister worms are in. The barnacles, however, might actually protect the shells from this, right? They're basically creating another calcium carbonate layer over the shell, and we just don't know yet. So I suspect that that it's actually could be a positive. So, have, have you or Chris actually tried to come up with like a historic distribution and abundance before the take really kicked into gear in the early 1900s? No, and I suspect maybe Steve Rumroll. I, I mean, he's done a lot of work with like that in Coos Bay when he was the reserve manager down there, but that'd be a great question for Steve. And then the, next, the second part of that is. Is this effort with a native oyster introduction one of those blue carbon conservation efforts? Yeah, it's a great yeah. I, the, yeah, there's a there's I think there's potential there. The problem and the challenge is how do you account for that properly? And so I just had a Pacific Shellfish Institute up that Olympia has been working on this a little bit because aquaculture folks, this is very exciting, right? Can they get an actual credit? actually trade in the market for growing oysters. And the challenge is when you make a shell, you're taking good stuff out of the buffer in terms of carbonate chemistry and buffer. So in fact, making a shell on a short term generates a little bit of CO2. In the long term, it creates a carbon storage. Right? So and if we don't have a good accounting for it, do that best then. There's a there's layer, it's a really good question, and I think it's something we need to study more. I don't think it's a cut dry answer, though. So, okay. but it's worth thinking about for sure because it's a way to engage the industry yeah. on that issue. <laughs> that out here, at least, they're very keen and understand the value, the importance of mitigating CO2. So, if you, oh, yeah. question in the back, and then maybe we'll grab a couple more. Online. Yeah, and then probably just one, one more on my Okay. I was uh, like the CO2 maps and I was wondering if you could, they're all about the CO2 like they were by sounding that they're the channel. Yeah, this could be the question. Yeah, so the, the question was about these, these surface maps of CO2 and whether we have anything in like Sally's Bend or up in King Slough. Um, I don't remember if I put some extras of these at the end. I do, we do have some, but I'll come back to here and I'll, I'll tell you what we got. So, King Slew, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to vote in here. <laughs> we actually spent a fair bit of this morning out here with the GPS and the sonar, just trying to map where the channel is so we can get up here more easily because it wanders all over the place and it goes from 12 feet to 4 feet and like 10 feet in some places. Um, so we haven't run anything up here because we, it's just challenging with the boat, but it'd be really interesting because there is fresh water coming down, there's watershed, there's all this high flat, there's a ton of metabolic natural CO2 that we expect there. We have run into the seagrass beds up in Sally's Bend a little bit with the boat, uh, high tides, It actually, uh, is it uh, almost 100, 150? PPM lower CO2 driving over those seagrass beds in the middle of the day, at high tide, and they were below atmospheric levels. So they're actually pulling carbon, right? They were below what we have in the atmosphere. So presumably they're actually sequestering carbon into those beds. And it's another really interesting question about whether seagrass are blue carbon. And, and what if you look really closely at the metabolism of seagrass over a whole year, it tends to be about net neutral. Now, but what they do do is trap lots of 
organic carbon, a lot of this carbon, carbon from outside the system. And as far as I can tell, that's probably where the, a lot of that blue carbon value lies in seagrass, because they do, they actually mitigate acidification on short term, essentially, but they're probably burying carbon just for trapping sediment and organic carbon coming down. So, yeah. Sweet. So, last question here from online um, is wondering might water velocity affect oyster size or survivabil survivability? The minimum, maximum, the range of the tide or the seasonality? Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah. So the question was, what, how is water velocity? How might that affect uh, oyster size? And that interacts with their feeding ability. So at certain velocities, it gets hard for them to actually capture particles because the water is going by so fast. We're not growing them in densities at low velocities. I think they're actually getting limited. So I think right in some situations, say you had lots of filter feeders and you didn't have a lot of water moving through, they could deplete the water and actually have less food for, for others in, the, in a group of oysters, say. I don't think that's happening. It's certainly not happening in our experiments. We're not that many there. But um, the kind of interesting thing is that it's changing the velocity. The water velocities are changing bi-directionally every day in all these sites. So there's probably average different velocities, say it swears landing. I expect there we're getting a lot more water flow than say up in Cape Slough. But you're still getting these really big tides that are moving water in and out. So, so I suspect it's just that's um, Jim Lerzak is does have this model. He did an initial model years ago with another grad student, and then they're developing a, a better constrained physical mixing model. Okay? And one of the things we did was in some of these tracks we did a few years ago, brought Jim's acoustic Doppler velocimeter profiler, which is a really fancy thing that just measures. The velocity of water, full depth of the water column. Strap that to the Donny R, little 16 foot boat, motor that around here and out here a bit to help constrain some of those velocities. Um, and it's, again, it's a really challenging question. So I think there's probably, not, there probably is an effect, but we don't, I can't really answer if that's happening in these sites. I just want to mention a, a kind of a nightmarish scenario that I don't think will ever happen here, but I went on a guided sea kayak trip in you know, Desolation Sound between mainland Canada and Vancouver Island. Yeah. And we were told to bring boots to wear. It's like wearing boots and a kayak weren't all that great. But the Pacific oysters are so dense up there and all the shells, you have six to 12 inch high stacks of dead oysters, but they're very solid yeah. and they are sharp. Yep. If you don't wear boots, you're going to get cut up trying to trying to get yeah. on shore. And it's just the density of the Pacific oysters around there is unbelievable. Yeah. And the nightmare would be if, if that should ever develop here. But it, so so the benefit we have with Pacific oysters and why it probably won't ever take hold like that is it's too cold for them here. That's why we have oyster hatchery up west because the water temps are cold enough that you most places there are a few spots, parts of um Parts of Willow Bay, I think it's warm enough. There's a few spots that probably back here might do a little spotting on their own, but it's usually too cold for them in many places. But up in the sound there must be a warm enough spot. Oh yeah, it's crazy how warm the water is in there. Yeah, and the jellyfish in there are unbelievable. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, and that's a trade-off, right? I mean, I don't know. I guess I'd be happy to wear boots if we got oyster all that time. <laughs> Yeah, they were Olympia. Right? Yeah, but they are Pacific oysters in places. There are parts of Australia, parts of France and Netherlands where they're actually considered invasive. They just have taken off Pacific oysters to such a degree on the estuary that they're effectively all kind of estuaries. 